$2,100? You gotta be kidding me. That's on sale? Yeah. I think I can build it for a little cheaper than that. Now the first thing I need to do is take a look at the spec sheet so that I knew what I was going for as far as the frequency response. Now as you notice, they say their frequency response is between 56 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And when we take a look at the spec sheet, that is confirmed when they say that their frequency response negative three decibel is 56 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So I knew I needed to find a woofer that could get at least a negative three decibel down to 56 hertz. And of course, a tweeter that's gonna be able to play all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So the waveguide that they use is very important. And what I found out with my research is that the particular waveguide that they use Parts Express offers one almost identical to it, which is perfect for this build. And that's this one. It's the Dayton Audio H6512. It's a six and a half inch by 12 inch waveguide. Now, when I decided on the compression tweeter, I knew I needed something that would at least get to 20 kilohertz. And while doing that, I might as well get one that is also a JBL. I mean, after all, we are designing a JBL clone or something at least close to it that we can build. And there it is, the Selenium. The Selenium got bought out by JBL a while ago and they are now all labeled JBL Seleniums. This is the D220Ti. It's one of the best compression drivers in this price range and it fits inside that horn perfectly. In fact, you can see that quite a few people have actually used these to upgrade some of their own JBL speakers. So we have picked out what I believe to be the perfect tweeter for this and the perfect waveguide but now we really need to work on the woofer now the woofer was a little bit harder because when you start looking at woofers you got to understand that we want to keep this box very similar sized and this box that the srx 815 is in isn't really necessarily the biggest box in the world that's about 18 inches tall by 18 inches wide and 27 inches deep so overall it's not a very big box and i wanted to make sure that whatever woofer we got would be in a similar size box. So the one I chose was Dayton Audio PN395-8. It's a 15 inch Neo motor. Now the reason why I chose a Neo motor instead of just a normal motor is because the Neo motor is a lot less weight. Meaning with the right materials this can become a fairly portable box if you decided to make it like the JBL SRX 815 in the essence of moving it from place to place. As you can see this actually only weighs 16 pounds and it's really high efficiency 97 decibels efficient. That's going to make this play extremely loud and not need much power which is another thing that I really wanted with this particular build. But we need to make sure that it's gonna fit inside a similar size box. So let's go ahead and open up WinISD and see what we can design. So here it is, the JBL SRX 815 clone in WinISD. Now we wanted to get to an F3 of 56 Hertz, which is what supposedly the JBL can do. Now the great thing about this, when I opened up in WinISD, we actually get a lower frequency response than even that. We have frequency response of 46 hertz of F3, which is fantastic. And we're getting a very linear response to that. The box size is only three cubic feet. In fact, when I went ahead and modeled this in SketchUp, it ended up being 26 inches high, which is a little bit taller, but it was only 18 inches wide and only 14 inches deep. Now you will notice that mine is just a little bit taller, although much, much shallower, which does give it a little bit easier room placement. However, the reason why it's a little bit taller is because I did add those two four inch ports, which allows me to tune it to get that better frequency response of the F3 of 46 Hertz. So now that I had everything designed, I had to go ahead and build it and get some measurements. So let's go ahead and start building it and then take a look at the measurements. Now for the build, what I went ahead and did is cut all the sheets down and then transferred them to my CNC machine. Now I use this CNC machine because, well, I have it, so I might as well. This was the easiest way for me to cut out, of course, the waveguide because I did want to flush mount it. Now if you don't have access to this, you can use just a normal router with a template bit if you want to. The most important part of all this build is just putting everything in the right spot. So those plans will have all the information on it and that's going to be on my website at toydsdiyaudio.com don't worry about remembering that it's going to be in the description of the video 
but after we cut out the woofer and the ports there's a couple things I need to tell you about one the ports we didn't cut out the full size I cut it a little bit smaller so that I could flush trim it after I glued it on you're welcome to cut it out the exact size if you wanted to as far as the woofer goes you're gonna notice that the woofer when we cut it down to recess it there's not much material left to glue or clamp onto when you want to screw it in that amount of material is just not going to hold that type of woofer so we are going to need to glue a ring on the back of that however we can't do that yet the first thing I need to do is glue the whole box together minus the rear of the box now there was a method to my madness the reason why I did it this way is so that I could fit the ring still inside and glue it however I wasn't sure if the ring that I had cut out was going to get in the way of the sides and it did so I had to trim a little bit of that off on the table saw to make sure it fit then just glued it in place and held it with a few clamps once that was done I could also glue on the rear of the speaker as well now I did make my front and rear baffle just a little bit wider than the actual box itself that's so I could flush trim it and get a nice even flush finish I did sand over that flush trim as well just to make sure that it was going to be ready and prepped for painting now the ports I glued in with CA glue that glues in in about 15 seconds really fast to glue in together and that allowed me to flush trim those port holes uh, flush with the actual ports themselves the only thing really left after that is to add some type of of bracing now a lot of these types of speakers like PA style speakers don't have bracing but I wanted to make sure to do that so I went ahead and cut some pieces out of some scrap material that I had that just allowed me to cross brace this in a few spots now you will notice that with the cross braces I did glue them together so all four sides are connected that does help it become more rigid and help reduce the resonance now if you want to install even more bracing you can do that as well and if you want the absolute best performance go ahead and line all the insides with acoustic material as well now all that's left is painting it and installing the drivers to keep in mind with the paint paint job especially if you're going to be moving this back to forth just needs to be rigid so get something with a high gloss on it in fact i painted mine with just roller and then on top of that i just put some water-based polyacrylic on top of that to give it a really nice hard durable finish now the best thing really to use for a woofer like this with this much weight and that can handle this much power is to use a T-nut. The reason why is because it screws in and it clamps down the woofer in place and it holds it from both sides. So it has a lot more clamping power. Now the best way to do this is to install the subwoofer like normal and then drill out the hole that your T-nut will fit. And then just take your screw and screw it right in like you would normally and that will bring the T-nut straight up. Now some people will glue these in place you can do that if you want to just make sure you don't get any glue inside the hole because if you do your bolt will not fit the pro tip here is always put the woofer in before you put the waveguide in the reason why is you can reach your hand through where the waveguide is going to go and you can spin that woofer to line up the t-nuts with the holes on the woofer it makes things a lot easier it'll save you a lot of time of course we're just going to screw that in and then screw in the waveguide and our speaker will be ready to do a little bit of testing so once I was done building the box I had to take some frequency response measurements and this is the response I got of the JBL woofer inside that enclosure you can start to see that baffle step is starting to occur around 700 Hertz and it's gonna end about 1.3 kilohertz that's okay we can take care of that just within our crossover point now what we're concerned about is that knee but I think with a good enough capacitor on there as long as it doesn't affect our impedance too much we can really narrow that out of there and and get a workable response now the reason why that might be a, an issue is because the original crossover for this particular speaker was designed at 1.9 kilohertz which is you know closer to here because of that I know that this particular speaker isn't going to cross over that high in fact it's going to cross over lower which is really beneficial to this particular design anyway because we'll be able to have less issues with beaming as the original design had which is of course a narrowing of the woofer dispersion so let's go ahead and take a look at the woofer crossover as I was working on this woofer crossover, originally what I did 
is I had tuned this a little bit higher to get kind of more of a bass hump. I thought that that would be really good is to get that more bass out of this one. But as I was playing with this particular woofer and, and dealing with the different uh, component values, I realized that honestly it just didn't sound nearly as good as when I just had it really flat. It sounded better when I had it flat and then just turned the bass knob up. So I left it at that because most people are going to be doing some type of EQ work with this type of build if they're using it outside. Inside, I don't think it needs it. Now, with the JBL inside the waveguide, this really came out perfect. And one of the things that I really loved about this inside the waveguide was one, it's a really nice even response. And two, when we see this hump here, that's gonna be down near the crossover point. So we're not gonna to have to worry about taming that, which is fantastic. It really works out really well. But in order to tame that, I know I'm gonna to have to do more of a third order crossover on the tweeter versus a second order. So I needed to really work on that some. And this is what I came up with here. As I was working it out, I got a really good response right around 1750 kilohertz or so. That's where the crossover point ended up being, and it worked out really flawlessly. Now, it does show the tweeter to be a little bit higher than it actually was when I did my final response check, but in XM, sometimes that happens. The final response looks more like this, and it's going to be a very, very even response altogether. All in all, this ended up being a fairly basic crossover. It ended up just being a second order on the woofer, a third order on the tweeter, and then just a simple L-pad. It really was a very simplistic crossover. And it ends up being what we would consider a nominal 8 ohm speaker. You could run this with just about anything. In fact, I ran this with my surround sound receiver. So you're probably wondering what my final thoughts on the build are. Uh, probably the best soundstage out of all the speakers that I've designed. They just are phenomenal. I mean, I got up a few times to make sure the center channel wasn't actually on because it sounded like it was. It literally sounded like it was coming directly from the center, which gave music a whole new life to them. I really loved them. And for music, I think they're perfect for that. Uh, and that's where I really see these. For someone that really loves two-channel music, someone that's doing karaoke, uh, keep in mind, these are not designed for huge rooms. They're designed for small to medium-sized rooms still. They're very, very good. Now, what I had designed them for originally was for my outdoor movie theater, and I think that would be another place that could also be used for. Unfortunately, a patron decided to purchase these from me, and he has all the parts, and he's going to be using them in his own karaoke build, so pretty excited for that. Now, if you did want to build this, check the link in the description. There are plans down there. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. This is Toyd's DIY Audio, and I'm out.